no. Um, and also if you have questions, if you wouldn't mind um, typing them into the chat um, and I'll keep an eye on them and then um, either stop Christy in the middle or um, uh, save them for the end um, and, and ask uh, Christy some questions. So Christy, uh, take it away. Thanks so much. Perfect. You guys can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, let's see here. Um, so I don't know if you guys have ever tried to put together a sedation analgesia talk in, you know, fit it in in 30 minutes, but it's a little bit tight and there's a lot for us to kind of talk about. But I want to just start with kind of thinking about three major principles that the PADIS guidelines kind of highlight for how we should be thinking about um, analgesia and sedation in kind of all of our ICU patients. Um, so really the first principle is the concept of analgo sedation, which is really treating pain first. And this is a concept where it's defined by either using an analgesia first um, sedation regimen. So, you know, reaching for an opioid initially and then reaching for something like propofol and Presidex on top or an analgesia based sedation regimen, which would be, you know, just an opioid to reach your intended sedation goal. Um, a pooled analysis for these guidelines didn't find any negative consequences of this approach, but it did show that there was a decrease in duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, and pain intensity. Um, the second principle is really when we do reach for those sedative agents, we should probably, not probably, we should be reaching for non-benzodiazepine containing um, sedatives such as propofol or Presidex. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is on the next slide. Um, and then finally, the goal of light sedation is really more optimal than deep sedation. There's been a couple of studies that have shown that with deep sedation within the first 48 hours of ICU admission, um, it's been associated with an increased time to extubation, increased tracheostomy requirements, um, and potentially increased mortality in our critically ill patient populations. So we'll talk a little bit about how to balance kind of our sedation requirements and our vent synchrony issues that we're having with these COVID patients throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, I'm not gonna read through this entire slide. Um, hopefully some of the most of you have, you know, at least heard some about these trials, but I did wanna point out a few important points. Um, all of these trials that have looked at sedation in the ICU, with the exception of the SPICE-3 trial, really excluded deep sedation. Um, so most of these studies really looked for a goal, RAS of negative two to one, which is our you know, really light sedation goal. Um, what these um, studies have found is that um, across almost all of them, um, Presidex and propofol is really associated with improved outcomes in our ICU patient populations. Um, so, you know, decreased length of stay in the ICU, shorter times to extubation, and potentially reduced delirium prevalence, which we know can, you know, contribute significantly to morbidity in these patients. Um, the SPICE-3 trial specifically um, looked at Presidex as a first-line sedative agent versus usual care, which was either uh, propofol or midazolam or a combination. They had the goal of a light sedation level of negative two to one, but they did allow deep sedation as needed for the um, primary clinician. Um, and uh, when reviewing the data, they actually, the primary clinicians um, said that deep sedation was required in 60% of patients on day one, 50% of patients on day two, and more than 70 patients in the Presidex arm required additional propofol or midazolam to achieve their goal sedations. So really what I took away from that study is if you are looking for a deeper sedation, Presidex is probably going to be inadequate um, to help you achieve that. And it did show increased um, bradycardia and hypotension as some specific side effects that you might see. Which brings me to the ROSE trial, and I won't go too much into this because I know that Sasha reviewed it yesterday during her presentation, um, but the ROSE trial completed by the Pedal Network was a reevaluation of the previous acuresis trial looking at um, patients um, with moderate to severe ARDS and a P to F of less than 150 um, who were receiving a PEEP greater than or equal to A and met other definitions of ARDS like bilateral chest infiltrates that were not um, due to another primary reason. Um, and they looked at 48 hours of neuromuscular blockade versus usual care, which they designed to just, um, described as light sedation targets with a RAS of zero to negative one with some open label neuromuscular blockade um, as needed for consistently elevated plateau pressures greater than 30. Um, 
All of these patients receive low tidal volume ventilation and a high PEEP strategy for up to five days after randomization. And as Sasha pointed out yesterday, this trial was stopped early um, due to futility, and they did not find any differences between uh, groups for in-hospital mortality, ventilator-free days, or days out of the ICU. Um, but what I did take away from this study is that in the control group, so this light sedation target, um, patients actually didn't require as much sedation as I had anticipated that they would. Um, so if you pull the supplement material, you can actually see the con control group, which is aiming for light sedation, um, did sometimes require heavier sedation, but you know the rascals there are negative 2.6, negative 2.3, um, not the negative four to negative five that we typically sometimes would see with an ARDS patient. Um, so I really took away from this that it may be possible to treat um, ARDS patients with low tidal volume ventilation and not actually have to target such a high level of sedation um, for some patients. I think that there are definitely some patients that we do need a high level of sedation, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, a question that came up the other day was how adherent were they to the low tidal volume ventilation? And actually it was reported that 80 to 87% of patients were in the control group were receiving the low tidal volume ventilation throughout day five. So maybe it's possible that we don't need such deep levels of sedation for some of these moderate to severe ARDS cases. Um, which brings me to this um, chart, which you may not be able to see very well on your screen, but that's okay because we're going to go through it step by step. Um, but essentially, this document was created um, for the current COVID pandemic, um, thinking about different sedation strategies and analgesia strategies for different patients, but then also anticipating from what we're hearing from New York and other centers that we may um, have ebbs and flows in our current um, supply chain um, and what we're able to get. So this kind of outlines, you know, first, second, and third line agents that we could think about and kind of a couple of useful tips and hints um, for each different agent and um, each different target. Um, so I think any good plan starts out with trying to figure out or establish what our goals are and then being able to determine how are we going to, you know, decide whether we're effective at achieving our, our goals. So these are kind of some of the main goals that we may see our sedative and analgesic agents titrated to. So for pain, we may use the CPOT or the critical care pain assessment tool, visual analog scale, or we may be titrating opioids to ventilator synchrony, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, for sedation, we already talked a little bit about RAS. Um, if somebody's paralyzed, we may use the BIS, or I, um, my understanding is that in some of the anesthesia areas, they're also using the SED line um, to determine how deeply someone is sedated when they're also paralyzed. Um, our delirium assessments would be a CAM ICU, and then when we're utilizing paralysis, we are either using TRAINA4, um, our peripheral nerve stimulation, to see how deeply they are uh, uh, paralyzed or ventilator synchrony again, which is, you know, kind of an easier um, just eyeball type target. So I wanted to um, just talk, touch about the RAS. Um, for the rest of the presentation, anytime you see a green kind of highlight, that would be the goal. So the goal kind of usually for our normal ICU patient would be to have them lightly sedated to drowsy but able to sustain eye contact in 10 seconds at least of awakening. Um, to voice um, or just alert and calm can, you know, interact in a normal way. Um, if we're not able to achieve some of our, you know, goals in terms of vent synchrony and other things to, with light sedation, maybe we'll move down to that moderate sedation of the negative three, um, some movement to voice, but not really able to sustain eye contact. And then in the orange towards the bottom, th that, those are our deep sedation levels, and we really try to reserve those for patients who are receiving paralysis, who we would not want to wake up and experience conscious paralysis, or sometimes patients who are receiving hypothermia, ECMO, or if we're unable to achieve ventilator synchrony with lighter sedation goals. Um, and that brings me to the ventilator synchrony assessment. So obviously we know that low tidal volume ventilation will decrease our minute ventilation and we may end up with permissive hypercapnia or increased PCO2. Um, and that in itself can cause um, increased respiratory drive and increased feelings of dyspnea for patients. So balanced against you know, the previous recommendations for light sedation um, is the occasional need for deep sedation in these patients for advanced therapies for ARDS. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that deep sedation may not be required for these patients. Um, 
And this was somewhat supported by what we just looked at with the ROSE trial. But if you've seen Dr. Hardin's previous lecture regarding these patients, he does note that low tidal volume ventilation is not always free. And sometimes the benefit of the low tidal volume ventilation does come at the cost of an increased need of for sedation for ventilator synchrony. But what I wanted to do was point out kind of how broad the definitions of ventilator asynchrony are. So they're here listed here. These are the epic definitions that you could pull in, and it's really a lot of different things. And so I just wanted to point out that definitely all of these um, actions that the patient may be exhibiting warrant evaluation to determine the price etiology of distress or ventilator asynchrony, but they may not necessarily um, you know, point only to the fact that the patient needs increased sedation. We might be able to um, help them out with other interventions such as PEEP, bronchodilators, suction of a big, you know, mucus plug or other vent adjustments, and then kind of be able to return to our previous levels of sedation versus just, you know, really ramping things up and getting them super, super sedated with heavy doses. So this brings us to the first kind of um, tier of our um, document, which is really the, um, the evaluation and um, starting to treat uh, analgesia first. So when we're looking at this document, I would encourage you guys to always look to the left first. We've tried to include some you know, helpful hints and reminders about what to think about when we're utilizing these different agents. So obviously, if we can use multimodal pain agents, we should. And also a recommendation to always start with bolus dosing. Bolus dosing is incredibly important, and there will be a slide showing that visually um, in just a, just a few minutes. Um, if we're unable to achieve our goals with the bolus doses, then obviously we could um, then move to a continuous infusion. And I think that we're seeing quite a bit of um, constipation and opioid-induced GI distress. So thinking about starting aggressive bowel regimens up front, I think, may help alleviate some of that. Um, so here are what I would consider my first line, second line, and third line agents, so between hydromorphone, fentanyl, and morphine. Um, as you guys have probably heard, we are starting to enter into a hydromorphone shortage, so probably moving to fentanyl, not probably, definitely moving to fentanyl on some of the units today, I believe Lunder 7 and Lunder 9, um, and then kind of going from there. Um, so this is more of a reference slide for you all. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but what I will point out is hydromorphone is, in my mind, kind of the preferred agent for specifically these COVID patients because we're seeing them, you know, be on the ventilator for a prolonged period of time. I think our average might be somewhere in the realm of 10 to 14 days currently. Um, and hydromorphone does not have an active metabolite. Um, it's least affected by hepatic and renal impairment, and it doesn't have the context-sensitive half-life that fentanyl has. And if you haven't heard that term before, that's okay. Um, the very next slide is I'm going to show you a visual representation of what that would mean. Um, so fentanyl is definitely like quick on. In the OR, it would be a very quick off. Um, it's a very great agent for quick on, quick off. Um, things like that, but it is hepatically metabolized and it has been shown to have decreased clearance in patients with heart failure, hepatic disease, and increased BMI. It has a few other um, just special considerations that I wanted to point out. Fentanyl does have activity at the serotonin 1 receptors and has been associated with serotonin syndrome when used in conjunction with other serotonergic agents. Um, and we can see chest wall rigidity and myoclonus with higher doses, typically greater than that max of 600 micrograms per hour that I included at the top. Um, it is very lipophilic and the half-life increases with prolonged use and in obese patients, which is part of that contact sensitive half-life that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, morphine is third. Morphine's not a bad drug either, but it does have two active metabolites. Um, one active metabolite has analgesic activity and the other um, active metabolite actually does not have analgesic activity but can cause neurotoxicities, myoclonus, and seizures if it accumulates in somebody with renal dysfunction because those active metabolites are renally cleared. Um, and then we can also see some histamine release with morphine, which would make it not as desirable in somebody that has hemodynamic compromise. So these are two really important um, uh, visuals for kind of some of the pharmacokinetic considerations that I was just talking about. So I'm going to start with the um, uh, graph on the left-hand side, and this is specifically talking about context-sensitive half-time that I was just uh, discussing with you all. And you can see fentanyl there in like the yellow to brown uh, color. 
So fentanyl typically at baseline, if you were using it in the OR in short IV push doses would have a half-life of two to four hours. That's been shown to actually, because of the large volume of distribution and the high lipophilicity of that drug, it's been shown that with a six hour infusion, the half-life increases to 200 minutes. And then over the course of a 12 hour infusion would actually increase further to 300 minutes. So you can think about how that would affect our patients if they're on a fentanyl infusion for a prolonged period of time, say, you know, seven, 10 to 14 days, you may really end up with a very prolonged time to wake after you turn the fentanyl drip off. So the pharmacokinetics get a little bit tricky for patients that are on it for a prolonged period of time. And that's one thing I think we really need to watch out for in the context of this COVID uh, pandemic as we start to move to the fentanyl infusions. Um, the second graph is showing the importance of bolus dosing. And I'm going to stress that a couple of times today. So what you can see, um, the blue line um, would be kind of considered how we would see a peak, of, or not a peak, a, a steady state effect of a drug over time. So um, one of the principles of like pharmacokinetics is that to reach a steady state, you have to um, wait at least you know four to five half lives of the drug. So if you're thinking about something like hydromorphone that has a half life of two to three hours, you really and you just increase the infusion. Really, what you're going to see is not the full effect until you reach that eight to twelve hour mark. Um, so with a loading dose, what you can see here visually, we would want to give at least 50 to 100% of a bolus uh, of our target maintenance dose. So you wanted to increase your dilated from three to four because your patient was desynchronous with the vent. You'd want to give a bolus dose of at least two to four milligrams. And that's going to help us see that steady state level or steady state effect on the patient much sooner than if we only increase the infusion rate. Um, we can talk about that more in just a little bit, but loading doses or bolus doses are really important with each dose increase that you make to somebody's um, continuous infusion. So just other strategies that we can utilize in these patients. Um, preemptive analgesia is always a great idea. So prior to ICU procedures that are associated with pain that make, you know, make your patient decompensate in some way. So if you know your patient's really sensitive to turning or the painful blood gas, chest tube placement is notoriously um, painful for patients as well as removal or wound care, kind of trying to think about utilizing bolus doses prior to those procedures. Um, we just talked a little bit about how bolus doses were so important. Um, we should start with those and see how we can, like how our patients do with that. And then if we have to transition to an infusion, we should be bolus dosing with each dose titration um, at that 50 to 100% maintenance infusion rate um, dose. And then utilize multimodal analgesia whenever we can. I know that some of these COVID patients are having some LFT abnormalities, some AKI. So, you know, if we can use acetaminophen or NSAIDs, we should be reaching for those as well. Um, and then we can consider other things like gabapentin for neuropathic pain, topical analgesics, and ketamine as an, uh, an adjunct to pain. Um, and then really after this acute period, we wanna think about weaning early and often and frequently. Um, before we move away from analgesics, I did want to talk about methadone. So methadone is unique in the fact that it has opioid receptor agonist and NMDA receptor antagonist properties. It's also been shown um, as other um, piperidine synthetic opioids to cause some inhibition of serotonin and norepi reuptake. And I think we should really start thinking about utilizing methadone in patients who we anticipate they'll be uh, intubated for a prolonged period of time. Um, it is a little bit tricky um, in terms of the pharmacokinetics. The half-life can vary from 50 to 60 hours, depending on your patient's um, intrinsic hepatic function and the presence of interacting substances. It has been shown to have a large interpatient variability with the half-life. Um, the duration of analgesic effect is usually four to eight hours, which is why we dose at Q8 when we're utilizing it for pain management. Um, the IV to PO dose is listed there, and then we definitely have to monitor QTC um, if we start methadone on a patient and their QTC increases by greater than 60 um, milliseconds, perhaps methadone is not a great agent for them. It could increase the risk for torsades. Um, as we were talking about with fentanyl, it has been associated with serotonin syndrome when used in conjunction with other agents. And it does have some clinically significant drug-drug interactions that you guys should just be aware of when we're utilizing it. But it is a great drug. That NMDA receptor antagonist um, property really helps kind of um, prevent some of the opioid or treat some of the opioid tolerance that patients can develop over time while they're in the ICU. Um, 
Sasha, was there any questions about like the analgesics before I move on or should we wait till the end? So far, no questions. So I think you can keep going and then we'll um, do more at the end. Perfect. Um, so after we kind of, you know, address our patient's analgesic needs, we're going to move on to sedation. Um, so again, starting at the left-hand side, we want to titrate to the lowest levels of sedation that still allow for our vent synchrony. And again, using that principle of utilizing bolus doses with each dose titration. Um, we should be performing daily spontaneous awakening trials for patients who qualify, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, and then progressing to deep sedation only if we're unable to achieve our goals with lighter sedation or if our patients transition to needing paralysis, that would also be a, another time when we would transition to deep sedation regimens. Um, so I've included the agents here. You'll notice that I didn't use that orange color for either midazolam or ketamine because I don't necessarily believe that either of those are third line agents. I think that they can both be utilized in different ways as a second line agent. Um, so my personal preference is to utilize propofol in any of these patients that we can. Um, you know, it's quick on, quick off. There's no active metabolites. One specific um, thing to consider for these COVID patients is that we really should be following triglycerides initially in at least two 48 hours. I think that we have all now seen that these COVID patients often have elevated triglycerides. They may not tolerate propofol. Um, We've been trying to avoid it once the triglycerides get in that five to 600 range just to um, you know, reduce the risk of pancreatitis and other sequelae. Um, there's always a risk of bradycardia and propofol infusion syndrome. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if your patient becomes unable to tolerate propofol because of high triglycerides or another contraindication, I think if they are requiring deep sedation, your best bet is to then switch to midazolam. Now, I know I said before that we want to try to utilize non benzodiazepine continuing regimens, but if we are requiring deep sedation, I think midazolam is, is the next best agent that we can use. Um, so it is hepatically metabolized via 3A4. The active metabolite is alpha hydroxymidazolam that has 80% potency of the, of the parent drug. And the half-life of that active metabolite is usually in the one to 12 hour range, but can increase to more than 25 hours in renal failure. So something for you to take into consideration. Um, and there has been shown that there's delayed clearance in critically ill patients, accumulation in hepatic or renal failure, and obviously benzodiazepines are associated with an increased risk of delirium. Um, which brings me to ketamine. I think ketamine is a great adjunctive agent to either midazolam or propofol to try to kind of spare the utilization of some of those agents. Um, it does have complex hepatic metabolism to norketamine, which is the active metabolite, which has 33% potency of the parent drug and a half-life of about three hours. Um, with ketamine, you want to monitor for hypertension and tachycardia. You can see increased airway secretions, although I haven't seen that be clinically um, relevant in our patient population currently. And then, as you may know, you can see emergence reactions on initiation and weaning. So we typically try to put a benzodiazepine on board, at least for initiation and, and weaning, um, or propofol for initiation and weaning, just to make sure that they don't um, see those emergence reactions. But typically, I think if ketamine is not super strong, it's a respiratory depressant. So if your primary goal is vent to kind of control vent dyssynchrony, ketamine may work as, as an adjunct, um, but may not produce that kind of on its own. So that's where I kind of think that its role would be in this patient population. <clears throat> um, so for sedation management strategies, again, start with propofol if the patient can tolerate. Um, if we have to move to benzodiazepines um, because we're not either achieving our goals or the patient can no longer tolerate propofol, I do think benzodiazepines are going to uh, give you a more reliable, deeper sedation if that is indeed your goal. Um, and again, bolus doses with each dose titration are really important so that patients don't end up on six of midazolam when they could have gotten by with a bolus dose on three. And then just to consider um, ketamine as an adjunct to propofol and in patients requiring more sedation um, or as a sparing agent. I did want to touch on propofol infusion syndrome because I feel like everybody loves to talk about this. 
Um, just to point out, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Sometimes it's very hard to nail down whether, you know, it's just the patient's underlying disease process that's causing, you know, some of these symptoms, or if it's truly propofol infusion syndrome. The incidence has been reported um, to be approximately 1% or just under 1%, at least um, from a critical care medicine review that was published a number of years ago. Um, the mechanism of toxicity is likely uncoupling or inhibition of the respiratory chain in the mitochondria via either interaction where coenzyme Q10 typically works or via inhibition of fatty acid oxidation. Um, and it's really characterized by the development of metabolic acidosis and cardiac dysfunction, oftentimes um, shown as a Brugada-like uh, syndrome of arrhythmia, um, or we can see cardiac failure along with rhabdomyolysis, hypertriglyceridemia, or renal failure. The um, reported risk factors in the literature include doses that are greater than 67 mics per kilo per minute, which is why we included that as kind of our upper limit of normal in this new sedation document, as well as the duration of 48 hours and in kiddos. Um, personal risk factors that I've seen, though, are morbidly obese patients receiving greater than about 500 or 600 milligrams per hour of propofol. Um, patients who have mitochondrial disease at baseline because they are, you know, more at risk to not be able to uh, tolerate an additional hit to their mitochondria. And then we've seen a couple cases of propofol infusion syndrome uh, that have been pretty profound after metformin toxicity, which causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And then the addition of propofol on top of that, um, patients really were not able to tolerate. Uh, the treatment is primarily supportive care to discontinue propofol. There's some animal evidence that perhaps coenzyme Q10 could work to uh, prevent the um, toxicity in the mitochondria as the mechanism would show you above, but that really hasn't panned out in adult studies yet. And then just for monitoring, we would monitor CK and triglycerides. So what's the role for Presidex? You know, dexmedetomidine, we use often in our ICUs. We talked about how it's great for light sedation. Um, you know, the fact that it's a light sedative, I think is both it's, you know, uh, it's pro and it's con, I guess, especially in this current pandemic. So it does provide light levels of sedation, but it does not depress respiratory drive. So if your primary reason for wanting to go up on your sedative agents is that your patient is experiencing vent dyssynchrony, it may not help you achieve those goals. Um, it's also been shown to have analgesic effects and opioid sparing properties. The side effects we would primarily see would be hypotension, bradycardia, and uh, drug fever. Um, so I would recommend that Presidex should really be reserved for patients that are entering the weaning stages of mechanical ventilation and, and thinking about a transition to pressure support in the coming uh, you know, days. Um, it definitely should not be utilized for patients requiring deep sedation or paralysis, just because we, again, we're not sure that it can even, uh, you know, accomplish those levels of sedation, and we definitely don't feel confident that it would provide a deep enough level of sedation during paralysis to be utilized in that role. You guys, I thought this was going to be a really easy slide to talk about, you know, obesity considerations uh, with sedative and analgesic agents. Um, because there's a lot of body composition changes that make the PK very unpredictable for highly lipophilic drug, but really there's not a lot of data outside induction uh, for bariatric surgery. Um, there's a lot of evidence for kids um, and how obesity would affect um, sedation and analgesic requirements in obese children, but there is not a lot of data uh, out there about kind of how this would affect obese adults except for the induction doses for bariatric surgery. So I at least wanted to include the fact that I, I looked into it, um, and I think that there's some things we should be keeping in mind, but not a lot of data there. So midazolam has definitely shown to have a, a half-life that is prolonged and an increased volume distribution of, by about 50%. I assume that this would be similar for changes that occur for other very lipophilic uh, drugs such as fentanyl. So I, I do think that fentanyl in these morbidly obese patients will still have a prolonged time of effect after we turn the drip off. And then I would just avoid higher weight-based doses of propofol for the morbidly obese, definitely less than 50 mics per kilo per minute, um, and just following those triglycerides. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that brings us to our neuromuscular blocking agents. Um, we provided a caveat uh, at the top of this um, section of the document that really talks about um, using intermittent as needed boluses of neuromuscular blocking agents over continuous infusions to help facilitate prone uh, 
sorry, lung protective ventilation and prone positioning. And then in the event of persistent uh, ventilator dyssynchrony requiring more than three boluses in two hours, suggesting then maybe switching to a continuous neuromuscular blockade with reevaluation frequently. Um, I know we're a little tight on time, so I'm gonna go through this really fast. Um, Cisatricurum is definitely our preferred agent. It doesn't have an active metabolite. Um, it's eliminated via um, cholinesterase enzyme activity in the blood, so we don't really need to worry about end organ function. We know that there has been an early shortage of cisatricurium, which has moved us over into that yellow column. We're using rocuronium. Um, you can see the kinetic differences that are slightly different there, slightly longer duration. Um, it does have an active metabolite that it has about 10% potency of the parent drug and is hepatically cleared. The vecuronium and succinylcholine are just there for your reference. So additional considerations, like I said, utilize bolus doses prior to just initiating an infusion if we require more than three doses in two hours or if we have a consistent plateau pressure greater than 30, consider, consider a continuous infusion. Um, I've listed here medications that can potentiate neuromuscular blockade activity, um, such as some of our um, antibiotics, lithium, and inhaled anesthetics, and then medications that antagonize NMBA activity, which would decrease the neuromuscular blockade, include phenytoin and carbamazepine. Additional patient populations that we would want to watch out for, myasthenia gravis, we would want to avoid succinylcholine. Burn patients may have resistance to standard dosing regimens, and there's definitely a risk of malignant hyperthermia and hyperkalemia with succinylcholine, we would expect that agent to increase potassium by, I believe, 1 to 1.5 just in a normal patient. So if somebody already has hyperkalemia, you would really want to avoid that. Um, this is a pro-con table just of additional agents for factory agitation. Um, so uh, just, you know, as we start to kind of get towards the end of the line, some things to think about. Um, we already talked about Presidex, phenobarbital, definitely can be synergistic, provides additional gap on NMDA activity, but does have a long half-life with multiple drug-drug interactions. I don't think we're gonna be in, uh, enrolling any board, anybody else in the remdesivir study, so that drug-drug interaction may be less relevant coming up. Um, clonidine, we, we'll talk about, it can definitely be helped to use uh, dexmedetomidine weaning um, and to reduce sympathetic drive, as can propofol, uh, propranolol. And then valproic acid is another agent that we reach for occasionally. It does have positive studies for refractory agitation in the ICU patient population, but can also cause LFT abnormalities and hyperaminemia. So you just use caution. There is a risk of pancreatitis. Um, so just some pros and cons for you guys to refer back to in terms of additional agents if you're really a, kind of at the end of your line with your um, other sedative and analgesic. Um, this is just a quick um, visual of what a typical SAT and SPT would look like. And I just wanted to point out, so the studies that showed, you know, you decreased time in the ICU and decreased time to mechanical, uh, decreased time to extubation, the way that they completed an SAT is they went through the SAT safety screen. Um, if there was no paralytics, no seizures, no alcohol withdrawal, they would really turn off these agents and wait for the patient to wake up. Now, that may provide like an SAT failure where perhaps they have respiratory distress, the respiratory rate increases. And what they would do is they would restart the sedatives at half the dose and retitrate those um, to the goal sedation levels that they had before the SAT screen. Um, so I think that this might be important as we start to utilize more midazolam and fentanyl. We may have a prolonged time to awakening, and if we perform daily SATs, we may be able to kind of get a handle on that sooner rather than later. Um, something to think about. I know we're trying to decrease the amount of time that nurses are going in, in and out of the room, so it may not always be um, feasible to do uh, in this patient population of COVID specifically, but I think if we haven't seen a mental status for a prolonged period of time, your patients on agents that we know can accumulate, it may be worthwhile to, you know, be doing SATs to see how long it actually takes them to kind of come out of that deep level of sedation. And then I won't talk about SBTs because I feel like you guys probably already have a good framework for those. So this is a question that I originally was not going to spend too much time on, um, just weaning strategies for sedatives. I thought it would be a little bit too nuanced um, and patient specific, but I, in retrospect, I think we're gonna actually work this week with some of the um, other pharmacists to put together a weaning document with some guidance and recommendations based on what we found putting this presentation together. 
So consider weaning for patients on continuous infusions for more than seven days. That specifically holds true, especially for agents that have high potency um, and shorter half-lives like fentanyl. Um, you could do a slow wean by 25% per day, although that's been shown to really drag out the time of the wean. So what I would probably recommend is addition of longer acting agents for faster wean. So we can think about adding lorazepam or diazepam, quantidine to help wean off Presidex based on the doses that the patient is receiving. Um, and there's not a lot of data to look at how to, the best weaning strategies for adults, especially in terms of benzodiazepinus. But there is some PICU uh, pediatric ICU data that was available. So they take the total daily dose of midazolam. They would divide by somewhere in the six to 12 range. I would say for adults, we might divide somewhere in the three to, three to six range. Um, and then um, you could get a standing out of end dose. So for instance, if somebody was receiving three of midazolam per hour, that would be 72 milligrams of midazolam per day, which we would bring down if we divided by six into 12 milligrams of Ativan, which we could divide into three milligrams Q6 for a daily dose standing. And then you could reduce by 25% per day from there. Um, for opioids, uh, we can you know, calculate out uh, equivalent doses for standing intermittent doses. Methadone, I think that we can think about uh, doing uh, cross titration fairly early. So it, there is some evidence in the burn ICU patient population um, that has shown significantly reduced time on the ventilator and potentially decreased delirium in patients who started methadone early. So I think that that's something that we're gonna look further into for the creation of this weaning document. And then fentanyl patches are a pretty easy way to transition somebody off of a fentanyl drip. We just have to cut cross titrate um, the drip with the patch. Um, so after the first six hours, uh, six to 12 hours, we can cut the fentanyl drip in half and then uh, take it off altogether once the patch has uh, uh, accomplished its depot effect. Um, we just can't use bear huggers because feet and heat sources would, heat sources would um, increase patch absorption. And that's really all I have for you guys. Um, so I know that we're a little bit tight on time, but I wanted to take any questions that you all have from there. Christy, there's one question about um, whether we're seeing significant post-extubation delirium in the COVID patients. And um, just if you could comment on which of the agents that we're using are more deliriogenic than others. Yeah, I think that we're definitely seeing a lot of um, post extubation delirium in our patients, even in our MICU patients, you know, who we've sent out, I feel like they still definitely have those like delirious eyes, um, not able to really figure things out. The benzodiazepines are definitely the number one, um, the number one proponent of ICU delirium. But really, if you're got somebody on, you know, a dilated drip of six and all of these other sedatives, and, you know, I think some of the delirium is just caused by the, you know, disease process of being hyperinflamed in general, but definitely benzodiazepines are a primary suspect. Was there a second part to that question that I missed? Nope, nope, that's it. And I'm not seeing any other questions coming in through the chat. Um, if other folks have questions that come up um, after, please feel free to email um, myself and I'll pass them along to Christy or Christy directly, um, or we can address them um, to tomorrow morning's lecture, which will be with Corey Harden on proning. Um, Christy, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, and um, everybody have a great day. Thanks, guys.